everybody. Back in the spring of 2020, when most of us were rolling around trying to figure out what to do with ourselves during the COVID lockdown, Mamadou Jai was laid off from his job and he decided to pass the time creating videos featuring weird facts you probably did not know about some animals who you almost certainly didn't know. But three years later, he is still doing weird animal videos, but it's more than just something to pass the time. His addiction to the creepy and dangerous natural denizens of Mother Nature has spread to more than 16 million TikTok followers, including this one, and coming up very quickly on a billion views. Now he's got a book detailing the deadliest of these organisms. It's called 100 Animals That Can Effing End You. Mamadou Jai joins us live because, well, you don't hear that every day. Mamadou, so good to have you. So good to be on, brother. And uh, yeah, that was a WWE style intro. I, that's amazing. I gotta have you introduce me to all my like venues. That was uh, that was oh, top tier. You, I actually, I, I used to do this for a living, believe it or not. Now, it, it, oh, but you tell. know, interestingly, because from what I read, you always had a thing for animals, right? You even told your mom you wanted to be a zookeeper. Wow, good, good, great question. But uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I remember I was either four or five years old. Uh, I might it might have just been because I had this old computer game called Zoo Tycoon. You created your own uh, zoos and uh, things of that nature. And I just went to my mom and said, you know, I want to be a zookeeper. And she was like, you're going to have to dream a little bit bigger. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I couldn't really tell you where the interest always came from. Usually when I get asked this question, I'll usually answer like I got zoo books as a kid, National Geographics for kids. All, and I was always on Animal Planet, but that's not really true. I did all those things because I was interested in animals, not not the other way around. So I really couldn't tell you where that came from. I guess that's just the way sure, I was wired. Sure, you, you obviously have a, a love for animals. But you seem to be attracted to the ones that I would say are harder to love. <laughs> What's that all about? I've always been interested in kind of like the more obscure aspect of nature. I mean, uh, a lot of times you feel like it gets too uh, Disney-fied. Mm -hmm. Obviously, nature isn't just always a horror show all the time. But I feel like people have this uh, thing they do where they romanticize nature where it actually does it like a disservice. It's not really in their favor. So... Uh, those aspects of nature, the things you might not necessarily see in a documentary, that's always what I found uh, more appealing. And uh, uh, selfishly, it's a lot its a lot more fun to like freak people out with those yeah, kind of Yeah, and facts. it's definitely very freakish. I'm wondering why you think it took off the way it did when, again, the sort of, as you say, Disney-fied version of nature seems to be pr predominant. I think it's more jarring as opposed to what people might have grown up with. They have, there are certain animals that have certain... Uh, con um, perceptions whether it's through media or through um just i guess different uh channels so uh it's like uh, it's kind of a break from what you normally expect and uh i think it's also coupled with the fact that i just say everything with like a deadpan expression and no emotion at all so like it's it's jarring so i think uh, i think it draws in a lot of yeah, people that it's, way it's that, but the content and yeah, the delivery there's no question about that and it's funny and you by the way you have a great radio voice by the way so you, you ever Think about Thank doing you. that for a living. You, you definitely could. You know, you do have a really specific kind of style. You come up with clever names for the animals. Like you said, a jaguar is a cheat code that God forgot to patch. And a striped anemone, which, by the way, i would never heard of, is an Oreo-colored body snatcher. A crocodile is an really overgrown murder that. gecko. I mean, you come up with these crazy names. Well, um, obviously, first and foremost, I like to consider myself an uh, educational um, channel, but uh, nobody wants to feel like they're being lectured to. You know, I guess I was part of the class of people that wa could sit and watch a nature documentary for two hours. Not everybody's like that. And the best way to convey information, in my opinion, is through funny, through uh, comedy. So, yeah, I'm not going to like if I'm talking about pandas, uh, you don't want to hear me say pandas like 50 times in one video. Like I might call them like an obese, like Oreo bear or something like that, or a bamboo. So, yeah. Different, different names that, that ways that it res, uh, that it resonates with the uh, audience. And uh, it's, it's ways that I can have fun with it too. Uh, a lot of, a lot of those names, I don't even like, like I have like a general guideline or something like a script that I'll follow, but those names are almost never in there. That's usually something that I just come up with off the spot. And it's just like, Oh, that was, that was funny. I guess really? I'll just keep that in. So yeah, it just, it, it keeps things oh, fresh. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, my favorite one, though, would be the tiger, which is a striped Uber to the afterlife. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, those are always fun. Yeah, it, it's it, the more dangerous an animal is, the more fun I can have with like the with like w- w- the nomenclature. So yeah, that I, I'm definitely proud yeah, of that. Are, one. are you ever surprised? Like I, I tell you, I'm reading your book, and I come across you know these are all supposed to be deadliest animals in the world, right? Zebra is on the list. Giraffe is on the list. I'm surprised that they're there. Are you ever surprised by these? Not necessarily, but I think it, again, goes back to the whole disnification of, like, nature and the way people perceive it. People have this idea that because an animal is like a herbivore, it's not necessarily a predator, that it's perfectly harmless, that we can just walk right up to it and take pictures. Like, every year in Yellowstone, there's a story of somebody that gets next to a bison. Mind you, these things are, like, well over 2,000 pounds, and they try to take a selfie with it, and they get gored, and they get sent to the hospital. And it's like... um. I always tell people like carnivores, something like a bear, a lion, a big cat, like you you have to convince them that you're worth the effort to kill you. Something like a herbivore is going to kill you before you can get to them. They don't know what your intentions are. So yeah, like uh, I don't remember what the exact number was, but on record, like zebras send more zookeepers to like the ER than the bears, than the uh, big cats, crocodiles, like and people don't really uh, realize that just because of uh, you think diet. that they underestimate the the ferocity of any wild animal, regardless of what its diet's like. They absolutely do, and you have to remember that, uh, especially a zebra. I'm glad you brought that up because they're like a really good example. Like they're herbivores that live in Africa, where they have to deal with lions, uh, hyenas, wild dogs, crocodile, all these things. So they're not exactly pushovers. I mean, there's a reason we domesticated horses, but we stayed the hell away from zebras. They're they're pretty feisty and um, that's what they need that they need that to survive. And people kind of forget that they forget how harsh nature can be and how tough you have to be to survive it. So there's a reason like, you know, you're not going to see a whole lot of zebras in petting zoos. No, not in the way you describe them. Uh, One of the animals and one of the scariest looking pictures, and I hope we can get this up uh, in, in your book is the wild dogs. Those things look real creepy. Oh, uh, yeah. Those are the ones that uh, get me in trouble with guidelines. I got to be really selective about what pictures I use. But uh, yeah, wild dogs are another great example. I mean, obviously, they're predators, but like they like like the name suggests, they just look like wild dogs. And a lot of people just think they're cute and cuddly and everything. And yeah, they they are behind like a plexiglass wall or a barrier. But like in the wild, like it's the fact that they're so small, they're pack hunters and they they have to deal with other predators. So as a result, like if they kill something, they got to eat it as quickly as possible. So like if you spend enough time with wild dogs, you're going to see some pretty gruesome, pretty graphic mm-hmm. stuff. And uh, yeah. And at the same time, I don't think that should really take away from them. I do think they're beautiful creatures. Their social hierarchy is really interesting. Um, they actually let the pups feed first, as opposed to like mo- like something like lions, obviously the male feeds first and then the females and then everyone steps in line. No, the, Wild dogs go out of their way to make sure the weakest and the most vulnerable get the resources first. So little things like that are interesting. But you have to remember, there's that aspect and the fact that there's like a picture of them holding like a baboon's face. <laughs> like, you know, you, you got you got to take both. You, you know, you bring up these sort of little known facts and figures about these animals and, and the things they can do and the way they survive. I'm wondering where you find all this stuff. So uh, like I said, I've always had just this intrinsic interest in like the uh, in zoology and the natural world. So over time, you kind of pick up these little facts and tidbits. And for a while, I just didn't I had, I had them in a vault and I just didn't use it because I didn't think uh, I, I would have. I'll just come by it. Honestly, I just felt like I was kind of a nerd for that. I didn't think people really had that kind of interest. And, you know, once you get to high school and then later on college, you kind of try to like redefine yourself. And um, I wasn't really just introducing myself to people as just like a guy that's like crazy about animals or I don't just have a whole bunch of animal facts on deck. But I think that was the great thing about TikTok. I was able to find, well, one, a community of people that were interested in that. And two, the fact that there was such a huge like audience for that kind of thing, like way bigger than I would ever um, expect. But um, yeah, it's just, you you just pick up things uh, over time, a natural curiosity, like I'm 26. So that's a lot of time to pick up like information And um, I think that's really helped because now, like, um, I still research my videos, obviously, but um, I feel like I have a really strong background as opposed to if I was making content about something about, I don't know, maybe space or, you know, something that I don't really have that background. And so, yeah. Did Did you study animals in college? Weirdly enough, no. And that always surprises people. I actually majored in environmental science, which doesn't really have a whole lot to do with animals, as a as you might expect. 
Um, I, I guess my rationale at the time was I, I love animals, but I felt like the only viable career option for me would be a vet. And I was not trying to go through that process. <laughs> I wasn't trying to go through a med school or anything. So I, I thought I figured that uh, environmental science would be the safe bet. What, but um, yeah, I was prepared for the animal thing to just be kind of like a side so hobby. What, what do your interest. parents think of this? They're not surprised at all. And it's the funniest thing because anybody that grew up with me, when they find out like that, this, how everything happened over the last couple of years, most of the time their response is, yeah, you know, he would blow up for something like that. That I would, I would see you on my for you page talking about like octopus or something. Like it doesn't really surprise them. It didn't really surprise my parents. It only surprised them because I didn't really, I didn't tell them about it. They found out about it on their own. Really? <laughs> okay, I, I can explain. So, so like, like I, so like I said, um, well, like you said, uh, I had been laid off, and I always mention this because the timeline is never not funny to me. So, I downloaded TikTok April fifteenth of twenty twenty. I found out that I was getting laid off the very next day. Um, I was at home. I mean, I knew it was coming, and I don't have any resentment because, like, I was a new hire. I was only there for about two to three months. I was still in the training phase. So if I was, so I was in environmental management, I was, I would work in like these, uh, project sites, but I would have to like be, I'd have to shadow somebody. So essentially for one job to get done, they would have to pay two people. And this is during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of our work is based in New York, which became the epicenter of like the virus. So, you know, I, I knew my days were numbered. They actually kept me on longer than they really needed to. So I appreciate them for that. But um, yeah, I was at home. I was unemployed. I was bored. So I was just making TikToks and stuff. And I didn't tell my parents because, you know, they're kind of old school. They're like, what? You're spending all this time on, what is this? Talk tick, TikTok, what, Snap tick, what? <laughs> that kind of thing. So, you know, um, and I was, I still felt a little bit awkward about it too. So like, cause um, I'm not really, it's weird to explain, like explaining it, but I'm not, I don't think I have the personality of somebody that would normally put themselves like out there like that. So I wasn't really, I wasn't just, Hey, check out my YouTube channel or check out my TikTok. You know, I was just this kind of thing that I was doing. If people found out on their own, like it was just, yeah, no, that's me. I'm not going to like deny it, but yeah. So it only surprised my parents. Cause like, they were like, so this is what you were doing in your room. I thought you were just on your phone. Really loud. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, so that was pretty funny. So let me, let me, let me just get this straight. You make a living doing this now, right? Yeah. Uh, TikTok and Very YouTube. cool. Very cool. What, what do you, how do you figure this will play out? Do you want to have a TV show? Do you want to, I mean, what's, what's the long-term impact of this for you? Uh, that, that's the thing. I mean, this all happened so fast. I didn't really have time to like plan everything. I was kind of just like taking it as it like came to me. Uh, at this moment, I think I'm just trying to branch out and see just how far I can take the YouTube thing. YouTube has been such a like really big resource for people like me and people can use it as a springboard for other opportunities, kind of the way I use like TikTok. So honestly, pretty much just uh, keep doing what I'm doing on YouTube, just see what kind of, um, you know, just what opportunities I can gain from that. But um, yeah, I'm kind of just, yeah, I'm kind of just chilling right now. Hey, chill on my brother. I uh, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about your videos and, 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 and how you do them because in them, you're, it's just you in front of a green screen, right? And you're showing pictures of the animals and you're holding a lavalier mic. It's, it's pretty basic. It is like the production quality isn't that like complex. And I think I like that because it shows other people like, you know, you don't need like the flashy editing or like a thousand different jump cuts or all these sound effects. I just, uh, I have my content and I'm not even really in the forefront. Like obviously I'm the face of it and I'm talking, but I feel like I like to think that I take a back seat and I let like all the weird and wild like facts that I'm conveying, that's like the forefront. And um, I think that's like the perfect brand of content for me. Cause like I said, I, I'm not really the type of person that's going to pull out like a camera in public and start vlogging my life. Uh, that's just not me, but like just being able to like kind of be like the messenger about all these uh, facts of life and the zoology and the natural world. Um, I think it's better that way. And uh, I feel like when you have that, you don't really need all of the other stuff that, all of the uh, extra it, stuff. It, so yeah, production quality. It feels not like it's authentic though, right? There's an authenticity to what you're doing. There's a humility to it and you're not showing off. And I think maybe that is part of what the appeal is to us folks who just, I just came upon you and I said, I like this guy's videos. You know I mean? I think that's what most people. Yeah. My whole goal, I want it to sound like I'm literally just having a conversation with you. 
And uh, it's always funny because uh, you probably noticed I wear a hat in every single video. So I don't usually get recognized in public because I guess it throws people off. Also, people expect me to be like younger and smaller, which I I get it. I have a baby face, but I don't know why they expect me to be like tiny. But um, it's not until I start like talking that people are like, wait, you're the guy that uh, does the like because I literally talk the exact same way in real life that I do in my video. So it's like like the dead. It's like the dead giveaway. So, um, yeah, that's my whole goal of my content. And I feel like uh, you kind of see the authenticity. Are people starting to recognize you on the street? Yeah, it's happening more and more often. Yeah, and I'm, I'm slowly but surely getting more comfortable okay, with it. fair enough. I, I'm curious. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the videos themselves because you do like to debunk sort of animal myths and, and, and misconceptions. And you, there's a story of a woman in Australia named Lindy Chamberlain Creighton, whose name mm. nobody knows, mm. but we know... Her little phrase her, that, that everybody's heard before. Yeah. Dingo ate Dingo my baby. Ate my baby. Oh, man. And apparently, it really happened. It, it, it did. Yeah. It was, uh, oh, man. You know, and I like telling stories like that because it's like a juxtaposition. Like, I'm talking about, like, and, and obviously, I exaggerate. I don't really think animals are evil. But then when you talk about a story like this, we're talking about a story where Dingo savaged, like, a baby, but the monsters in the story were the people mm. because of obviously it became a whole media circus. People like painted her as guilty before she ever stepped in court. And then when she was in court, people were like, I think they said, Oh, she's the way she's dressing. She's not, she doesn't look uh, depressed enough. She's not, she's not sad enough. She obviously did it. And uh, it, it, it became a nightmare. And obviously my respect goes out to her because not a lot of people could handle that. One, just knowing that your child was taken from you in such a, such a brutal way and then sitting like in a cell with the entire world thinking that you did mm. it and then even when you're exonerated people it becomes just a punchline like there are so many people that know that phrase but don't know ex like the story so um yeah i wanted to talk about that because it'll never not like bother me when i think about it because that was that was really like a failure of like not just like the justice system but just like just humans like that that's like a really nasty way to treat a human especially in those circumstances you know, that all happened in australia which you refer to mm -hmm. as Satan's petting zoo. And I got to tell you, you make me think <laughs> that's one place I don't want to visit because the animals are just too scary. That's true. But at the same time, and, you know, I might make a video on this as well. Uh, I'll, I'll use hyperbole a lot because, again, like uh, education, I try to be like the intersection between uh, educational and entertainment. I think people call it edutainment now. But um, there are like a lot of like great aspects of Australia. Also, the animals are like, they mind, they mind their own business. I mean, as long as you're not actively looking for problems, you're probably not going to have them. I mean, you might find like like a snake or two in your toilet oh, yeah, or something, just or that. maybe a yeah. spider in the corner. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just it's just regular stuff. I mean, it's not perfect, but um, you know, there's also pretty, some pretty uh, um, it's a it's a beautiful country, a beautiful uh landscape, and with a really beautiful history. So you know, I don't want to scare people off from the entire like continent. But um, there there is some stuff in there. I'm not going to lie to you. There's like a, uh, the snakes in the toilet thing was an exaggeration. Yeah, I think there's one scene where the guy's pulling a snake down out of the ceiling and then the whole ceiling falls down and it's full of snakes or something. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Oh, to be fair, if I'm thinking of the same clip, that actually wasn't in Australia. That might have been um, might have been uh, Thailand okay, or something. Or so, I could somewhere in that wrong. region. So, yeah. I, yeah, but... But I'm sure something like that has happened at least once in the entire history of Australia. So, yeah, you're, you're technically not You do not a whole wrong. video, as a matter of fact, on just the noises that these that the animals in Australia make. And they are some scary noises. Oh, yeah, they are. My favorite's definitely the uh, possums because you possums are not supposed to sound like that. And uh, if you've never seen a possum before, but you hear that sound at night, you really don't like they, – they have these, well – stories about drop bears these evil like koalas that like to jump people from like the trees and a lot of people see it as like it's just a myth to scare tourists but if you're in australia and you hear that sound it's like damn it's just not a myth okay <laughs> but um yeah no the sounds of australia are definitely uh yeah i mean i can't even describe it you'd, you'd have to like experience it in yeah, person yeah yeah um there's the, you did a video that really kind of freaked me out on pigeons Oh. <laughs> okay. Um. So I, I don't hate any animal, but if there was any animal I was ever afraid of as a kid, it was pigeons. 
I cannot explain to you why. And it's it's one of the worst fears to have when you grow up in the New Jersey, New York they're area. They're everywhere. You're not escaping them. Yeah, they're all over. And I don't know where it came from because, like, a lot of people say they're rats with wings. I wasn't even afraid of rats as a kid. I wasn't afraid of, like, snakes. I love spiders. I always wanted to, like, swim with sharks. Pigeons did it for me, and I don't know why. And then I challenged myself to, like, make, like, a positive video on pigeons because there's no way they're as bad as, like, my childhood, like, told me they were. And then you start looking into them and you realize the whole, first of all, the rats with wings thing came from, like, I think it was a park commissioner that only worked for, like, a year and a half, like, in New York, who was calling them that. Uh, at the same time, he was also, like, blaming, like, the homeless and, like, gay people for, like, the property value of, like, New York going down. So, you know, got to uh, the perception was a little bit skewed. Exactly. But like, and then you look at like the studies and pigeons are no dirtier than any other animal. They don't spread more disease than any other animal. They can, but like, so can your dog. And I see people kissing them all the time. So can your cat, but they'll still rub their butt like across your forehead and people are okay with that. They're no worse than any other animals. In fact, they're probably like, and as far as birds go, like pigeons are probably pretty good pets. So like, um, yeah, I made the video and it was also like, like almost like a healing experience for me. Cause it's like, damn, they're not that bad. I was, I don't know what I was tripping yeah, but over. Those, those, those weird, I don't know, inbred, whatever. Pigeon. I don't like that at all. <laughs> that's not even the pigeon's fault. We did that to them. So that's, yeah, it's, it's nasty work. I, I, I ain't right, with a that. couple more, a couple more questions about the videos. A couple of the animals, the most dangerous animal in the ocean is not the great white shark. Oh man, uh, I don't even remember what I. Ate. Oh, was that, is this about the no, jellyfish? Well, that, that, those are horrifying. Or, I was thinking or, about the, or the or the puffer fish, the or ooh the orcas. Yeah, that's interesting because te on paper they are they're apex predators. Literally nothing really. The only thing an orca has to worry about is a literally a bigger orca. At the same time, there's never been a case of a wild orca attacking or killing a person. Uh, it happens in like obviously captivity, but when you put an animal like that in a fishbowl, it's a, you, you kind of. Yeah, you're kind of putting yourself in a line of fire. But um, yeah, orcas are, um, if they really wanted to start messing with people, like it, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Like they're intelligent um, and not just intelligent. They they have trends like us. They have cultures like us. They, they even have different dialects, like the way, like the difference between somebody in Boston or somebody in Baltimore. Same thing with orcas in different like areas. Like they have accents and they have dialects and they're super smart. And they figure out like a lot of the, and that's the thing. When you're an apex predator and you don't have to worry about another predator, you get you have a lot of time to like figure stuff out. So you look at the way they hunt sometimes and it's like, how who told how'd you figure something like that out? It's 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 interesting to watch, but it's also kind of chilling because it's like, man, we if we were ever in like the same environment and we had to compete, it'd be it'd be a lot of problems for yeah. us. Yeah. You call them the humans of the sea, I guess, because they are kind of destructive in their way. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so is there anybody who sends you ideas? Like, you know, here's an animal. You should do this one. Oh, fans send it to me all the time through DMs. I'll, they'll send me uh, videos asking me to explain it or like pictures or or one of my favorites are like these memes where it's like, oh, pick uh, spend 30 minutes with X animal in a room and you win $10 million. Which one are you picking? Those are those are fun. I love the hypotheticals because it's like uh you know, you can go in a lot of directions with those, but um, it's definitely my fans. And uh, if it's not that, it's just stuff that I see on my own. Um, obviously, my <laughs> my for you page, my algorithm is just full of all that kind of stuff, so I can't escape it even if I wanted to. But um, yeah, no, I find inspiration pretty much everywhere. Like that part of my brain that's like always in like the creative mode, I it, I almost never turn it off. I can't turn it off. So um, yeah, I'm I'm always like looking for like a. Uh, just new ways to make content and new th ways to like freak yeah, people yeah, out. Yeah, you're very good at it. Um, a couple of more. Who is the deadliest animal on the planet? Us. <laughs> Us by far. Um, yeah, I'm not even trying to like sound edgy or anything like that, but like by far we've caused so many extinctions and obviously what everything that's happening in the world, definitely okay. us. Cause um, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Here's another question. Quick answer. Do you have a pet? Ironically, no. And that always surprises people. Um, I wasn't, my parents weren't crazy, especially my mom wasn't really crazy about animals. The closest thing I had, the pets were like fish and they did not last very long. Um, 
no pets. Uh, it even got to the point where I was just volunteering at like the animal shelter so I could just like play with dogs and cats because like I don't have any in my house. But um, yeah, and it always surprises people because they expect me to have a whole petting zoo in my house. But um, yeah, okay. no pets. And what is your favorite animal that obviously you don't have as a pet, but in a perfect world you would like to? Okay. Uh, okay. Before I say anything, uh, I'm totally against exotic pets. Terrible, really bad. But you said in a perfect world and in a perfect world, I would have an elephant because I, I just think they're the perfect animal, in my opinion. Uh, they're intelligent. Obviously, their uh, social structure is really interesting. They, they have the capacity for like really human emotion. Well, I can't say human things that we used to assign to only humans. Um, they can have empathy. They can they can grieve. They grieve over the loss of their loved ones. If they ever come across bones that belong to one of their former members, you can see it's like a funeral procession. Actually, funny thing, there was these a story of these elephants that uh visited a man that was like looking after the, them. Um was Anthony Lawrence or Lawrence no Lawrence Anthony. I always mix that up. And they all showed up to his house after he passed away. But like they showed up, like some of them had to travel as far as twelve hours and we still aren't a hundred percent sure how they knew that. Um but yeah, no, elephants I've always had like an elephant fixation even as a kid so yeah i would definitely have an elephant if like laws and like ethics okay allowed me. and you had a lot of shoveling time <laughs> oh yeah true true that's a good point i mean i guess i could if i had a, if I had a lawn i would just call it yeah, fertilizer there'd be a so. lot of it you know oh man mama oh, yeah. Duke, jai thank you so much for your time and joining us on you don't hear that every day because this is definitely a conversation you do not hear every day his book is called 100 Animals That Can Effing End You. <laughs> and uh, great videos. You can find them on TikTok and, and YouTube as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, YouTube on uh, Casual Geographic. Uh, TikTok, M-N-D-I-A-Y-E underscore 97. Because uh, I never changed my username. I had the same, like, like, you know, same, like, just typical username everyone has when they join the app. And I just... I, I never expected it to happen the way it did. So I just never bothered changing it. And by the time I did, I was like, people know me by this name. So I might as well it's just. too late yeah. now. Yeah, but um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I have an Instagram, the same name as my TikTok, M-N-D-I-A-Y-E underscore 97. And um, yeah, I try to post uh, daily, if not uh, three, four times a week on there, a uh, video every two weeks on uh, YouTube. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what yeah, I'm up right. to. Well, we appreciate your time for taking a few minutes out of your day and uh, sharing your ideas and thoughts with us because it's been fascinating. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I've uh, had a lot of fun with Very this. Very good. All right, Mama Duke. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.